Thank you so much, and welcome everyone. Um, I hope the day has been going well so far uh, with the opening talks. Um, yeah, my name is Kenneth Seals Nutt. I'm a director of software engineering at a tech, a food enabled tech startup called Verb Energy, as well as um, a co founder of a research collective called Science Stories. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about um, how I use software and a computer science background to really drive accessible food networks and, and food um, um, security. Um, this word accessible is intentionally bolded and colorized um, because throughout the talk I'm going to kind of show you what, what I mean as the word accessible um, and how the definition kind of evolves around um, some of the problems that I try to solve for as well as some of the um, initiatives that I've uh, thankfully been a part of. And so first, I'd like to start off by saying what this talk is not. Um, I think whenever I'm asked, um, what do I do for a living, and I say that I'm a software engineer at a food company, there's a lot of different ways that can be interpreted. And so for me, I like to first preface that, um, for one, I'm not doing anything that's science, like sci-fi or futuristic. I'm really just trying to find ways to um, leverage um, technology and, and um, creative thinking and innovation in ways that we can um, give consumers um, products faster, more reliable, and incorporate feedback. This lecture is, this talk is not going to be a programming language lecture intentionally. I, when I think of the word accessible, I think it's important for people that are in technology to be accessible and talk in plain language and, and really try to bring everyone into the fold. Um, I'm also not advocating for synthetic or computer engineered food. Um, sometimes when I tell people that uh, my background is in uh, software engineering, they're thinking, how am I trying to apply the software to the food itself? I'm really talking about breaking down the barriers that are inhibiting people from um, getting access to that. And then lastly, um, I'm not trying to find ways to replace um, humans, especially um, in agriculture and um, in you know, trying to use AI or artificial intelligence for um, um, replacing jobs or um, you know creating more scarcity um, in that way and so I'll kind of walk through a couple sections here uh, I'll first talk about my background um, some of the things that I've done in the industry um, some of the things that I do in my research and then kind of tie it all together with this framework of accessibility and so for me um, the story that I have to tell is really about accessibility itself um, before I got into software, I was actually in um, the culinary industry. I was um, started out as a sous chef, worked my way up to an executive chef and owned a catering business where um, for me it was a big part to give back to my communities. I tried to find ways to assemble small teams that were scrappy um, that could offer catering experiences at a fraction of the budget. Things like weddings and, and big life moments that people were able to have. Oftentimes, you know, caterers in um, and um, you know, major restaurants would charge a fortune for some of the same food that we were able to get um, in accessible ways. And so that really brought down the, the cost of entry and, and uh, made um, you know, people's life experiences that much more memorable. And as I got more involved into technology, I was trying to find a lot of parallels. When thinking about um, the, the phrasing test and iterate, which is a big part of computer science and, and um, software development, that was no different than generating a menu, testing it out, seeing if what things people like, what things people don't, refining the menu, working directly with um, the colleague and, and your business partners um, to really to, to figure out what's the best way to you know, achieve the ingredients and, and the sourcing. And then when I moved on to software engineering, a lot of those principles kind of followed uh, suit with me. And then uh, kind of transitioning from software development into um, software leadership and, and really assembling teams um, to drive bigger features and initiatives, um, a lot of those core um, um, beliefs and foundations of like making sure that when I'm talking about you know what the next best thing is for our business or really trying to find a solution to a problem making sure that the engineers that are um, a part of the the solution to that problem are able to really understand um, the problem at hand and get um, the best results out of it and so um, so that's kind of what led me to Verb Energy. Um, what we are is a um, direct-to-consumer food and beverage brand. Um, they started around three years ago, and I've been on the team for the last two. And our mission statement is exactly that, is we're on a mission to make great energy accessible every day. And when I'm talking about energy, I'm, we're, I'm talking about 
you know, conferences thrive off the amount of coffee that is supplied for you, you know, always being awake and, and, and having all of your synapses firing. And we find that energy is very personal. Um, you know, people sometimes don't like the taste of coffee or, some, or sometimes, um, you know, having coffee is the only source of energy is, is inaccessible for people that can't have it. And so we're trying to find ways to, you know, really fine tune um, what energy means to an individual. And with us, it was our flagship product um, that we call our Verb Bar. Um, and it's pictured on the left here. And so, uh, I mean, on the right here. So what this bar is, it contains um, green tea extract as the caffeine source. So you're not going to get those jitters um, that, that you would often have where you would sip a coffee and then have a long crash at the end. Um, when we were developing this product, we were really trying to find ways to you know, make sure that this can be something that's additive to people's lives and not something that's, um, you know, you always have to go find or, and look for. So we, we wanted this to be something that was edible because you didn't have to worry about could you hold it in your hand? Could you, um, you know, if you're on the go, could you fit it in your pocket? Um, we really wanted to make the, the experience as seamless as possible. Even traveling out here, if we, with this product, we were able to bring it on the plane and, and still be able to stay awake um, when, when we were going through um, security and things like that. And it was really trying to th solve a problem of, um, we find that most of our energy sources today are either, um, are, are either only liquid, only like very high intensity caffeine, or they're marketing to a customer base that's not the everyday consumer. Um, when we think about companies like Red Bull, where if you're seeing like the images and the pictures, you know you're, you're really trying to see someone at their most extreme moments of their life, or the most extreme representations of a person. We often try to use images like this, which is a, um, a fire department, and, and notice you're not seeing someone running out of a burning building. You know, you're seeing someone in their daily life, you know, so that this is something that they're using throughout their, their, um, their life, you know, throughout their um, work, and maybe they just had a very boring day this day and needed a pick-me-up. You know, we really tried to make energy accessible in that way, where it's not just, you know, the life extreme moments of, of people's lives, and we really wanted this to be something that was natural and vegan and as well as gluten-free. And we also partner with um, a former Michelin chef to refine the ingredients, um, refine the flavors that we're, we're putting into the products. And as well as on my side, the technical side, um, finding ways to bring this uh, product to life at scale. And so um, one thing that is core to our business is that we're a tech-enabled direct-to-consumer brand. Um, uh, we intentionally didn't start off on the retail play because we thought, if we could bring this directly to someone's hand, we can really learn about the product quick. Um, you know, thinking about um, things like what time of the day do people like to eat, eat, eat our products or how often can they consume or um, you know, what, part, what ingredients are we finding that people aren't able to eat because of um, you know, certain dietary restrictions. And with starting with that business model of being direct to consumer and uh, we develop a, a direct to consumer SMS business, that um, all of our transactions um, have the ability to be managed over text message. As our product line grew, as our customer base grew, the things we could do with that um, ability enabled us to have even more power over making our products accessible. We're, also, we're able to give people um, you know, messages throughout the day if they've told us that they're using their product for going on a big hike. We can set them a reminder in our system and then ask them how it went. Not only is that giving you energy to like say, oh, someone really cares that I gave this information to you through the product as well as the experience itself is energizing. Um, we've been able to really change the way people consume a product as well as interact with the brand in this way. Similarly, I use software throughout our job, especially as being stewards to the global um, supply chain. With, you know, one of the biggest examples being the, the conflict going on in, in Russia and Ukraine right now, there's massive implications to what that means in terms of sourcing natural ingredients. We really try to make sure that the products that we offer our consumers are able to get real ingredients that um, are not grown in a lab, that are you know, coming from sources that are giving back to their own communities as well. And so whenever there's um, conflict or um, blockages in the supply chain, those directly impact us. So 
in terms of my role, I'm trying to find ways that we can advance technology and partner with some of our supply chain competitors and, um, and find ways that we can automate and, and find direct lines of communication um, to make sure that these processes are running smoothly. And then outside of, um, you know, in industry, a lot of my work, in especially some of my foundational work, is uh, backed in research. Um, around four years ago, um, a professor and um, um, postdoctoral um, candidate at Yale University and I started a research collaborative called Science Stories. This started out as um, just an experimental project as, as two friends wanting to find a way to learn about new scientists throughout the world that we find are underrepresented, forgotten, and intentionally overlooked in society and wanted to give them a voice and a social platform. That started out as just with a few um, people that we really wanted to um, to, to showcase, and now we have over 3,000 um, scientists from, from marginalized backgrounds, and we, we consider these unforgotten um, pioneers in, in science. In terms of food, we're able to pull in um, um, researchers and scholars that are um, nutritionists, that are epidemiologists, that are um, inventors in terms of supply chain and, and making new ways to um, uh, bring our food um, to our tables. So if you're able to go to our website, sciencestories.io, and search a nutritionist, you can see a, a whole swath of people that really made an impact in today's um, society. Kat um, was the information architect behind it, and I was the software engineer, and so our partnership was really based upon taking the strengths of both of our backgrounds and bringing something compelling to life. And this can be used in a classroom setting. Someone as young as eight years old can be able to understand the information. Um, as well as someone can be using it for a, a college or an academic research paper. We really wanted to make the information that's packed behind it accessible as well. So, we, so if uh, you were on the site and were to click on one of these images, you would see high fidelity media, you would see videos, you would see um, their academic works. A lot of this is we were going directly to the source of this information, that, um, such as universities where things were backed behind a paywall or you had to be a member of the university to see it. One of our missions behind this was to create this digital transformation in some of our libraries and research institutions across the US and, and around the world to prevent the need from having a software license or a, or a, um, or a, or a image license to be able to show the images on the web as long as we're able to give attribution. So we were able to partner with the University of Oxford, we were able to partner with um, the Smithsonian to really get some of the content on the web for the first time and that's completely free and accessible for all. When we started that research project, it had many offshoots. Our, our net that we were um, you know, focused on was just mainly uh, women and people of color in STEM. But then we saw that there was a direct um, need as this research collaborative grew um, to start breaking down some of the data that we were um, curating about these, these people. Um, and Related to food here, we, we started a new project with a, with a professor in, at Johns Hopkins that's about identifying food deserts in, um, throughout various parts of um, our you know, global ecosystem. We use what's called a, um, a, a wiki base, which is a um, knowledge base used to power some of our uh, more popular um, uh, knowledge base um, um, architectures such as if you were on Google and you saw the little knowledge panel that shows up, a lot of that information is driven throughout the same, with the same technology to kind of pull information from a lot of sources and um, really standardize how we're interacting with it. For us, we wanted to find ways to impact um, food scarcity concerns across the globe by one, tackling the problem of um, making sure that our products were multilingual. If I'm looking at a tomato and, and someone from another country is, how do we make sure that we're talking about the exact same thing? You know, it, that has often been one of the barriers um, for building research um, and finding ways to um, promote medical health and, and uh, epidemiologists, epidemiologists finding ways to really give back to communities of other um, languages is that oftentimes there's not really a translator there. So we're trying to find ways to disambiguate and make sure that we're talking about the right food groups all of our um, infrastructure is machine readable, which means um, people that have other networks can tap into it. We're, we, we don't have to only be human to human to, to get the information where um, we can 
you know, have this be integrated with a grocery store that's trying to source ingredients to make sure that they're able to pull in um, um, products that are giving the right nutritional value. And also, everything that we, we have is backed is free, open source, and fair data. And we call fair data as something that anyone can access and anyone can reuse. Um, so that's a big part of um, what makes software development very tricky, especially in the research industry, is that oftentimes people have a big research project and all of the data behind it or all the results are private or proprietary. We really wanted to make something that we can share the resources, share the results, as well as companies and universities and, and hospitals can use this information to really drive new creative projects with it. And so we, we're working on a research paper right now with Johns Hopkins and um, coming up with a lot of creative ways to, to leverage the data that we're architecting. So I've, I've been mainly focused on the data side. And then in terms of the application, we're finding food deserts has a um, broad meaning as well. In terms of bringing nutrients um, to a location, and making things accessible, it, it takes many forms. It may look like a um, night, night market in Cambodia, which was one of our um, resource, resources that we aggregated, all of the food composition metadata for um, Cambodia. It may look like um, pulling in um, the nutritional profiles of a village in, in Kenya. Um, which is another one of the food composition tables we uh, curated, as well as um, understanding the impacts of um, um, people's location to the nearest fresh produce market in inner cities, such as the image of um, Oakland, California here, which is another one of our um, spots where we're trying to really find what's the difference between um, where someone lives based on their, their nutritional health and their access to um, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, even through our most populated cities. And as we started this project, um, we, we've took on some new partners. Um, we're really trying to um, make sure that we're approaching this with open arms and making sure that um, this um, project is not only going to have an impact on our mission, but also other um, institutions and organizations as well. Um, so we've been working with an um, ontology called Food Ontology. They're based in Canada. Um, and their mission is um, finding ways to um, find all of the relations of food and their components that make up their, their um, profiles, such as fat, lipids, you know, making sure that um, all the vitamins are tracked um, for every single food group. And we're really focused on the nutrients and the, the nutrient profiles that generate um, that uh, makeup. And so we're able to build this partnership and form a bridge throughout our, our data between each other. And, in terms of how many entries of specific foods um, that are completely unique and disambiguated, we have about half a million. And every day we're finding new institutions that are um, um, bringing in, you know, their government-backed um, um, versions of their food composition table, such as we have with the USDA here. Um, we're piping this into our, our data platform so then we can aggregate when we're talking about, you know, a tomato has this many calories, Another country might have a, a different lab and a different grown um, source that will come up with a different amount. And so how do we you know, rationalize and build out recommendations in, in terms of if, you, if I was a nutritionist and said you have to hit a calorie count or, or a vitamin count per day, how do I make sure that that is, is regionalized and localized to the community? And so that's something that we've been very much working on. And beyond, um, for me, I find that Everyone has a role to play in building food systems. I, um, you know, my role I find is in software development and computer science. I've used my research as well as industry in kind of like a cycle. And I find that that's like the case with most things that are developed in the computer science industry. They start out as some far-fetched research project and then 10, 15 years down the road, someone has found a way to innovate on it bring it to a wider audience and build a company around it. I'm really trying to use this as a cycle for con not only con continued development, but also continuing the spark of, of research itself and building some of these accessible um, networks. But this isn't limited to just technology. I mean, there's ways that we can use art, there's ways that we can use um, financial um, backing, and so that's why one of the reasons why I'm so proud of this conference is that it allows us to really think through the intersectionality of our work, and, and I may have been 
you know, thinking about giving a talk at the Internet 2.0 conference, but then saw, okay, there's a lot of parallels with some of the work that I would talk about there with the food conference. And so, yeah, just wanted to thank everyone for their time. And, um, yeah, I'm open for any questions if anyone has any. You mentioned the identification of food deserts. You mm -hmm. have a collaboration with Johns Hopkins, I believe it was. Yeah. I don't, that seems like that would be an easy identification to discover. What data points are you using? How, you know, how is your, your, your tech and your data for, for providing those conclusions? Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. It's a very easy problem to solve in most places. Oftentimes, the issue is that they're overlooked by a very laser-focused um, um, cohort. So a place like Oakland, California, where you know there's a plenty of grocery stores, very high-end grocery stores nearby. There's some places that where people live, they have to walk a mile and a half to get there, and or the, maybe there's only a convenience store next to them. And so it's one thinking about geospatial data and thinking of how far um, someone is to that nearest nutritional value. It's also figuring out when we're talking about, you know, mark um, milestones that people are trying to hit, such as, um, you know, the daily nutritional value, how that is um, regionalized to the specific person. So we're taking into account localization. We're taking into account the government-backed FTCs um, behind it and figuring out how can we partner with, you know, rural areas as many as much as urban and suburban areas to you know really dive into the um, ecosystem but yeah hope does that answer your question at all Uh, just going by what I have to do with my own business and uh, having an IT background, how on earth do you find the f the the time to do the software unless without hiring you know fifty sixty developers? Because <laughs> yeah, that's one of the big problems we have, and I think it would what um, helps is conferences like this where we're able to really just have passion behind a project. Oftentimes, it's not just backed by venture capital, um, but it's also having people that are familiar with grant writing and f finding ways that we can, you know, leverage research as much as we can leverage industry um, to find the time. You're, you're absolutely right. A lot of these research projects start up and then die very soon after because we don't have enough resources and engineers behind it. And so for me, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to find bridges in, ter in terms of having people that want to walk both lines in terms of um, being software engineer as well as a, a researcher. But yeah, that's an excellent question. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> My question is, what, what is something that you know now that you wish you had known a couple of years earlier being an engineer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, I, I think engineers are often taught that they have to find the problem that they're trying to solve too early, ver and that sometimes neglects you from diving deep into the skill set itself. And I think that's something that I, you know, would have appreciated earlier on in my focus is like really trying to go deep and understanding more about um, problems that I don't know yet exist. And oftentimes if I have an idea and I want to build it or, um, you know, you'll get really tunnel vision in terms of just figuring out the necessary tools to, to bring that idea to life. Where along the way, you know, there's plenty of other problems to be solved and, and finding ways that might not feel technical or should be solved with software, but then once you have a passion behind it, you're able to find new way, new and creative ways to innovate. But yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. All right, thank you all so much.